Hello everybody, Dr. Steve here again from Thompson Plaza, Chiropractic First. Um, happy to welcome everyone. Again, I hope everyone is uh, staying healthy and fit. Uh, please, if you didn't see our first uh, part of our part, uh, five part series on our critical health information series, please request some information from our clinic or we'll give you a link for either WhatsApp or you can go on YouTube. Um, but it's really, really critical information right now. Today, what we're going to be doing is going into our part two. We're going to be talking about uh, some essential nutrition. Um, so I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to get all this information. Now that we are uh, still not able to meet on our weekends, which we usually do our workshops, we want to make sure we get this vital information out to everybody. So as we talked about in our five part series, these are the vital signs. This is what we're going to be covering each week. Last week we talked about the central nervous system and how important that is to our health and our immune system. Today we're actually going to be focusing on nutrition. Part three next week will be on our posture and all the bad habits and how that affects our health. And of course rest, recovery and sleep, how to choose your pillow, all those things, and then exercise. So we're going to be uh, presenting these hopefully every week or every two weeks. So please make sure you, you follow the full series. There's a lot of vital information. So first of all, just uh, wanted to very quickly these are the things that we're going to be talking about today. We want to answer all these questions. So first of all, what is it that we should be eating? Um, or what should we not be eating? Um, a lot of people already know all of this, but I'm, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that. What supplements do we actually need? Now, some people, this is kind of controversial. Some people use sub, uh, supplements, some people don't. And so I want to go through which ones are critical and why this is so important. Um, how do we reverse the health and, and aging process problems? How do we improve our memory and our thinking? So these are some of the things we're going to cover today. So please feel free. Again, at the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for anybody that has any questions. Um, we're happy to answer those questions for you and go over that information. So just uh, by way of brief uh, uh, review, what I really want to help people understand, as I've been practicing for over 31 years, is really the difference between in our system of taking care of patients, there's really a health care system and a sick care system. So we talked about this a little bit more in depth last time, but just briefly, sick care is when we wait until we have a disease or we have a condition or a symptom. Now this might be pain, it might be muscle tension, it might be numbness, it might be a headache, or it could be heart disease or cancer. These are all conditions and symptoms. So basically when we're in sick care, we go to seek relief. Typically it's a pain medicine, we might go to a hospital, we might have physio, we might have surgery. So sick care is really waiting until you feel something and then you go to the doctor. Okay? Health care is actually preventing. So prevention is the key. Preventing or avoiding the disease in the first place. Uh, so it's a lifelong strategy. Health care isn't just about because you want to be healthy for the rest of your life. Doesn't mean you're automatically going to be healthy. It takes work, it takes focus, but it's well worth uh, your lifestyle and the activities for the rest of your life. So we're going to be talking about uh, exercise, nutrition, rest, habits, and of course the central nervous system. These things are very critical to our health. So <clears throat> last time we talked a little bit about this. this is, I want to bring this up again just because everywhere I've practiced in the world in different countries, we always tend to, as human nature, determine our health by how we feel. Sometimes we say, well, I don't have pain. I don't have numbness or tingling or tension or dizziness or headaches. So if you don't have a symptom, we assume that we're healthy, which may not necessarily be the case. Because there's many people who do not have any of these symptoms, but they may have higher low blood pressure. They may have diabetes, which you don't feel until it's actually in its later stages. Um, gastric problems. Some people have those, some people don't. Um, difficulty sleeping or resting, fatigue, tired, memory problems, flu, allergies, or sinuses. These are all different types of symptoms. And I've even had people come in and say, well, you know what, I have absolutely none of those. Well, that's an excellent thing. That means that they are in more of a health care mode rather than sick care. So this, if you have any of these, or answered yes to any of these, you are in sick care. You're already experiencing a disease or a condition. So what we want to do is help you focus more on not having those and so if you don't have those it's still critically important that you stay in healthcare. so we want to prevent these from happening we don't wait till we have a heart attack and then decide we're going to change our diet and our exercise program we don't wait until we have headaches or pain or extra stress 
before we start addressing these problems. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. So, <clears throat> as we mentioned last time, all experts around the world agree on this one thing. The single very best treatment that you have for any type of disease or condition is prevention. Prevention is the key. And this is where we stay into the health care rather than the sick care. So many of you have ever heard an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this has to do with financial. It's much cheaper if we prevent problems than wait until we have heroic life-saving procedures that are very expensive. Also as far as being invasive, surgeries, um, chemo, all these later types of treatments can be very uh, draining on our life and they can literally change your life. So the goal is to prevent that. So it's definitely well worth it, the effort that we put in. <clears throat> so the question is how do we do this? And we talked about this. I'm just briefly going to go over this. We have to make sure we have a strong immune system. A weakened immune system is also related to cancer, cardiovascular diseases, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, kidney problems, disc degeneration, pain. Yes, your immune system has to do with pain, muscle tension, memory loss, disrupted sleep. So this is all sickness or disease. So please go back if you haven't, like I said, and watch the first series. We talk a little bit more about that, okay? So what is the immune system? The immune system is a system that spreads throughout the body. It's a series of cells, organs, proteins, and tissues. And what they do is they help to identify and fight off foreign invaders. Could be a bacteria or a virus, etc. And so that's what that is is <clears throat> is designed to do. Our body is designed to heal and to, to keep itself healthy. But the most vital component of the entire immune system of all those cells and organs is the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the master. It is what regulates the function of all those cells and tissues. So the goal is we have to have a healthy nervous system. Okay, and <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit more last time. There is a condition in the spine in the central nervous system that if you have what we call a subluxation, which is basically a misaligned or a dysfunctioning joint, it means it's not able to perform its full function and motion, it starts to cause irritation in, uh, on the nerves and basically they start to decrease their output or they may increase the output, which now throws us into a disease, but it does affect our immune system. So, <clears throat> many causes of these and we all, are, we all have posture habits whether we're talking on our phones or texting or whether we have bad posture at our computers and so forth, which we are going to talk about in the future um, in one of our posture series. Stress, everybody has stress, financial stress, emotional stress, especially during this time of the pandemic. People are worried about their job, they're changing the types of seats they're sitting on, so we will talk about it. And of course trauma, falls, car accidents, these are all part of causes these subluxations, which now is going to affect our nervous system and everything else. So, there's only one way that you can remove a subluxation, um, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is why it's critical right here. There's only one way to remove that, and that is with the chiropractic adjustment, okay? The difference with the chiropractic adjustment is it's unlocking each independent joint in the spine, which allows those nerves to flow, or allows cerebrospinal fluid and oxygen and glucose to go to the brain. So that's why it helps with memory and so many internal type uh, problems or conditions. Um, physio is good. Um, medications sometimes they can be uh, helpful, uh, particularly in a life-saving instant, but they do not remove subluxations. Neither does surgery. Neither do exercises. Those are all great. And some of these are great for supplementing, but they do not remove subluxations. The only way you can get rid of them is with a chiropractic adjustment. So, it's essential that you get your spine and your entire family's spine. Everybody that you know, your friends, your colleagues, they should be getting checked and adjusted frequently and consistently. It's just like exercise or anything else. You have to be consistent with taking care of your central nervous system. And so, and this is for life. This isn't just like brushing your teeth until you're 25, then you don't have to brush them anymore. If you're going to maintain the health of your teeth, you floss, you brush, you do everything you can to prevent that disease from beginning. Same is true with your spine. So this is very, very important. <clears throat> so now, everything else that we do to the spinal adjustment, chiropractic adjustment, and the central nervous system are supplements. So we're gonna talk about these now. Today we're gonna talk about nutrition, 
in the future we'll talk about sleep and exercise. But they're all just supplemental to this, the chiropractic adjustment. So whether you have symptoms or conditions or not, you need to be checked. So today we're going to talk about this. What should we eat? What should we not eat? What supplements do we need? How do we reverse conditions? And how do we help our memory or our thinking? Okay. So first of all, we need to know why. It'd be really easy for me to just hand a hand out to people and say, don't eat this, do eat this. But that usually just goes right in the trash can. Because if we can transform the way you think, we can transform the way we eat. In other words, I want to spend some time not just telling you what you should eat, but why you should do that. Uh, same with our exercise, same with sleeping habits. If you don't understand why, it's easy to just brush it off and not do it. So we're going to try to transform your thinking. Hopefully you'll not think about diet and nutrition the same ever again. We all know that there's common conditions related to diet. These are some of the common conditions or symptoms that people, again, they wait until they're in sick phase or care before they start seeking some type of attention or help. Irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, celiac disease. Now some of you may have had these conditions. Some of you may know somebody in your family or a coworker that has these. Um, some other really common ones, acid reflux. A lot of patients with acid type reflux. Uh, heartburn, as it's called, and different types of indigestion. Sometimes people have bloating and different types of digestive, but not always. Some people don't have those as yet. Okay, so the goal again, prevent them from happening. So first of all, I want to talk about a couple of myths. Okay, myth number one, and that is that cholesterol is bad. Now I know that this has been uh, kind of got some bad news over the years. And I've had many patients here said that they won't eat the, an egg because of the yolk and it has uh, animal fats, so they are, therefore they're afraid they're going to have high cholesterol, um, which really is false. Um, a lot of research has been done on this over the decades. Um, from 2015 to 2020, the dietary guidelines have actually been changed because it's been found that cholesterol is not considered a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. So in other words, by eating good fats is not going to cause cholesterol problems in your arteries. That's false. Okay. So what is affecting that is what we call trans fats. So dietary fats associated with heart disease, they're coming from the processed vegetable oils, okay, which are loaded with trans fats. They're oxidized, oxi uh, sorry, they're oxidized, and then they start causing placking in the arteries and in a lot of inflammation. So the key is it's not the natural fats, it's the fried foods and the trans fats, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So the first thing I want people to understand is it is okay to eat fish oils, it's okay to eat uh, butter, it's okay to eat eggs and those types of things um, because they are good saturated fats. Myth number two, diet drinks. Some people say that they are good for you, that's absolutely false. Sometimes people will put different types of artificial sweeteners in their coffee and their teas, those types of things. This is what's been found. Aspartame, NutraSweet, a lot of people are familiar with those names. Sucralose, there's different types of sweeteners now. You have to really watch the labels. But links have been found, been found uh, from aspartame consumption to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, and brain tumors. So this is really serious stuff. These are not natural, normal chemicals going into our body. So we really need to be careful. The hard part is sometimes people don't start to notice these problems until they develop later so they just keep using them over and over again. Aspartame promotes diabetes and also obesity, okay? all kinds of metabolic dysfunctions. It's a really common term you hear now, metabolic syndromes. Artificial sweeteners are found to increase expression of genes that are linked to fat, uh, production and inflammation. Inflammation is the major problem in our body. That's what causes heart disease, it causes inflammation in your arteries, that's where the placking starts, so we need to avoid that. Aspartame and NutraSweet, different types of sweeteners are a problem, so please avoid those at all costs if you can. Another myth, high carbohydrate diets with a low fat diet is best, and this is absolutely false yet again. Again, this goes back many years ago, there was some flawed, uh, misinterpreted research from a German uh, scientist and doctor that they said that fats were causing problems. Okay, but they've been now proved that that is not true. When you start having a high amount of carbohydrates in your diet, it starts causing damage to the gut wall. Now, this is what the inside of the stomach looks like. It has these little villi, these little finger. That's what absorbs our food. And they found, a lot of people have heard a lot about um, using different types of grains and so forth. 
they start having problems in their stomach and that's because it nubs off or it destroys this it creates an inflammation inside the wall so we lose our ability to to absorb our foods so <clears throat> Dr. Tim notes, this is another reason why, not just for the digestive disorders, but for diabetes. Dr. Noakes was a well-respected scientist, um, one of the foremost experts on low-carb uh, diets. According to him, and the research that they're showing, is insulin resistance is the real killer. So it's not the fact that we are eating fats, it's that we're getting too many grains and too many sugars. So. What we need to understand, the main driver of chronic disease, now think of all the chronic diseases from cancer to degenerative joint diseases, uh, muscular atrophy, all of these different type of chronic diseases, even memory issues, is coming from a high carbohydrate diet. So we need to rethink this. Okay, a low carb, high fat diet is crucial for preventing and reversing an insulin resistance and type two diabetes. He even states, this is his comment, that one of the worst mistakes you can make is given a type 2 diabetic insulin. Now you probably know people or maybe even yourself you've been on insulin. I'm not telling you to stop taking insulin but what we are saying according to Dr. Noakes is that that's one of the worst things you can be doing. Your body is producing its insulin it's just not um, sensitive to it so it's not absorbing it. So giving it more insulin is causing more of a problem. So it's virtually all type 2 diabetes is, is reversible. That's according to their research. Moreover, there's also a hormone called leptin. It comes from our fat cells. This is what tells us our appetite to turn on and turn off. Okay, It's responsible for the actuary uh, for signaling insulin resistance. So many times, it's not necessary. If you have high insulin resistance, you're also going to have a leptin problem as well. So. By changing our diet habits, changing our carbohydrates and essential fats, we'll change these things that we're experiencing in our body. Okay, so <clears throat> if you're overweight or obese. Now one thing I want to point out, one teaspoon of sugar is equal to four grams. We put that on there because sometimes labels will talk about grams, sometimes we'll talk about uh, teaspoons. But a normal average woman can have six uh, recommended basically that no more than six teaspoons of sugar in a day okay for men the recommended is nine we have a little bit bigger more muscle mass so we get a little bit more, a few more teaspoons so those are what is recommended if we stay in those zones where we're, we're going to stay healthy the average person right now consumes about 26 teaspoons of sugar every single day okay so when we start looking at this over consumption of sugar a lot of it's coming from sodas, high fructose corn syrup, which we'll talk about. One soda has about 10 teaspoons of sugar in it. Okay, so that's a lot. That's 40 grams of sugar in one can. So by drinking one soda in a day, you've over four times for a man of what you should have in an entire day. Okay, so this is definitely going to lead to some metabolic problems. This is where the problems are. High fructose corn syrup, fried foods, there's the sodas, all of the stuff that, that is good, all the stuff that we enjoy. It's fast foods, it's sweet, we love this stuff, but it's highly, highly toxic and it has a high sugar content. So we want to try as much as possible to avoid these. Now, all of us are gonna have this sometime. Nobody's perfect, so the goal isn't to avoid them completely. Well, you can, if you can, if it's possible, it is great. But most of us are gonna break down. The key is not living and relying on this so much, okay? So, what should we eat? These are the things that are very important for us. And most of you already know this. We should be eating foods by nature. That includes organic natural foods as close to nat nature as you can get them. So that means uh, organic raw fruits and vegetables, uh, grass-fed beef, free-range chicken, okay? Non-farm raised uh, fish, so you want fresh fish, whole eggs, yes, that's the yolk and everything's included. We can have raw nuts, almonds are really good for alkalizing the body, a good source of protein and good essential fats. Uh, avocados, coconut oil is fantastic. I cook with coconut oil and a really good organic butter. They're great for cooking. Um, the fish, fish oils, now virgin olive oil is good to put on salads, but you don't want to heat it because if you cook with it, it turns to a trans fat becomes toxic in the body. So if you're using a, uh, an olive oil, just use it without heating it, okay? So 
those are some of the things that we should be eating. So, some of the good carbohydrates that you can have, rice, brown or white, doesn't really matter, or quinoa. We can have oatmeal, uh, buckwheat, we can have potatoes, which is white or a sweet potato. The key to having these carbohydrates is not the overconsumption. Again, you want to keep that as low as possible. Ideally, between 20 and 40 grams a day, depending on what your goals are. If you have diabetes, it needs to stay under 20 grams per day, or a maximum of 20 per day. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of the examples of good, healthy carbohydrates. Vegetables, you can eat as many vegetables as you want. They're considered a negative calorie. Because of the fiber content in there, it actually takes more digestive energy to burn them off than it does than what they uh, present in the body. Also, it helps to clean the gut. Okay, So, <clears throat> things that we should not eat. Okay? Very, very important. Okay? Processed foods. These are all foods by man, basically. Processed foods, because they're canned or packages because they have lots of preservatives. High fructose corn syrup, sodas, those types of things. Fried foods, fried chicken, anything that we fry, we need to stay away from because that creates the bad trans fats, which are going to tear up your arteries and start causing plugging cholesterol issues. Um, so that's what we want to avoid. Sugars, we've been talking about. Grains, avoid grains as, as much as possible. That means all the breads and the pastries, I know all the good stuff, but it's very, very important that we avoid those not only for our absorption, but also for the blood sugar levels. Caffeine. It's a stimulant, it does cause a lot of problems in our body. Uh, confined aminal feeding operations, uh, just kind of an example of it here, what they look like. This is actually a, uh, a yard where they actually raise cattle and this is what where, uh, where they raise chickens. And you can see they're in these contained operations and they give them a lot of antibiotics, a lot of steroids, a lot of pesticides in these foods and then we end up eating it. So. Um, this is actually in 2009, they found that in these confined uh, animal feeding operations, the American factory farms used 29 million pounds of antibiotics okay, uh, in that one year alone. So it's estimated that non-therapeutic use of antibiotics, uh, which is in the livestock, the livestock to prevent them from getting disease because they're in these uh, contaminated areas, um, it accounts for 70% of the total antibiotics used. So we need to stay away from these types of things and of course all of our fast foods, high sugary, high grains. This is what antibiotics do to us. They kill both the beneficial and the pathological bacteria which causes a lot of gut absorption problems. It upsets the balance of your intestinal terrain. They found that clinical levels of antibiotics can cause oxidative stress to change your DNA. Okay, which really is going to start creating some health problems. Uh, the proteins and the lipids in our body. So you really want to stay away from antibiotics as much as we possibly can. They've also found that antibiotics increases the rate of bowel cancer. Okay, just another thing to think about when you're eating regular foods or if you're going to take a medication, I have a cold, I have, it's even though an antibiotic doesn't work on a virus that's commonly prescribed when people have the flu or different colds, um, those are not bacterial infections. Those are actually viral infections, but yet we still take them and we have a high increased rate of bowel cancer when we do that. So, another reason why you want organic foods that are clean is they don't use glyphosate, which is a uh, very, very powerful uh, antibiotic uh, pesticide. They spray on the plants to kill all the pests. Um, they found that it's 40 to 80 times the normal threshold, um, which can damage our tissue and our bodies. So, it's extremely toxic. They're finding all kinds of problems. Here's some of the Side effects from eating foods with glyphosate, depression, autism, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, cancer, different types of gastrointestinal problems. We have obesity, cardiovascular disease. These are very common. You're going to hear these a lot. Birth defects, uh, skeletal and brain malfunction, DNA damage, neurotoxicity, reproductive problems. We have a lot of women with menstrual cramps or people that can't uh, get pregnant, miscarriages. So we've got to be really careful endocrine system disruption, infertility, and allergies. So we want to stay away from our regular foods that are that use a lot of these pesticides. Okay, here's another myth. And I put this, the medication myth, into the diet because it's something that we're consuming. Some people think that it's safe if we just take some medications for pain. 
oh, I have a pain, so I'm going to go take a Panadol or any other type of pain medication, and that is actually false. Okay? They found that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Panadol, Advil, Tylenol, all these types of things create ulcers, tinnitus, ringing in the ears, stomach irritation, bleeding, heart, uh, heart problems, liver and kidney damage. Those that are using the corticosteroids like prednisone, um, bone loss, weight gain, diabetes, cataracts, risk of infections, suppressed adrenal gland uh, production, and memory loss. So a lot of people think that these are, yeah, you know, it's just a simple pill, it's just gonna get rid of my pain, but they are very, very toxic. They have to go through the liver. The body has to try to identify those, and it creates a lot of toxicity, especially if you're using them regularly. I read another research study that was talking about people that are using antihistamines because they have sinus problems in conjunction with a pain reliever or a, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory and they're starting to have brain bleeding. So you've got to be very, very careful not only what you're using but what chemicals you're mixing. So please, if at all possible, avoid those. Try to stay on the natural side. Um, these are some of the other things from steroid use, sepsis, broken bones, blood clots. Okay, that's even with short-term steroids. And it's really common that people have, oh, I'm just gonna go down and get a jab or an injection because I have this pain in my knee or in my back. Or, um, but these, these steroids can cause some real big problems. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you here, these are some of the supplements that are essential. Now one thing, before we talk about these, years ago, um, people hear all the time RDAs, what's the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C and these different vitamins hard part is a lot of people think that if they get the RDA that that's the health level. That's not. Years ago a council came together and they decided we need to determine how much vitamin C, how many of these different nutrients we must have to stay alive. So you don't end up with scurvy and rickets and Paget's disease and all these other different vitamin deficiency type diseases. What is the recommended minimum? And that's what that is. So a lot of people say well I'm getting your RDA of vitamin C which is very very low but that's not for health. So a recommended allowance for health is much higher. So some of the supplements that are critical, especially because of the way foods are processed now, the minerals lost in the soil, um, we don't eat enough good raw vegetables and, and healthy organic foods. So this is where supplements become so critical, so vital. I use these every day. So first of all, a good multi-mineral, a good multivitamin. The B vitamins, you want between two and 500 milligrams uh, per day. Choline is really good for brain development. Vitamin B12 is good for energy. A lot of times, and for nerve conduction, sometimes people will go to a, a neurologist or another health type practitioner and they'll give them a supplement that has B12 and B6 in it. That's because it's really good for carpal tunnel because of the nerve conduction. So those are really good for that fatigue, tingling uh, in your extremities, muscle weakness, those kind of things. So if you have those issues, you may be having a vitamin deficiency. So <clears throat> vitamin C, 2,000 to 5,000. Yes, that's correct. Milligrams per day. Vitamin C is for all of the collagen in your body for repair. We do damage every single day and we have to repair those structures and vitamin C is an essential component. It's also good for our immune system. It's a very, very good uh, antioxidant. Vitamin D3. Vitamin D3, between four and 6,000 I use a day, even up to 8,000. Um, it's essential in every single cellular function in your body needs vitamin D3. And we'll talk about that just in a minute because that basically comes from the sunlight. And I'll talk about that. Vitamin K1 and 2 is really good for cardiovascular disease, or health and strength and protection of your arteries. Zinc, you hear a lot about this right now in the COVID. You've heard a lot of people talk about the different problems. You hear zinc mentioned a lot. Zinc is and, and a mineral, a nutrient that's needed throughout your body. It helps your immune system and the metabolism. That's why it's so important, especially during this pandemic. You can take it as a preventative, but also it helps with other types of repair and function as well. It's also important for wound healing, uh, your sense of taste and smell. So magnesium, uh, magnesium is essential for muscle function, heart function, also for your memory, uh, vitamin E, we need between six and 800 uh, milligrams a day. It's also a very good antioxidant. The essential fatty acids, krill is my favorite because it's also very highly uh, anti-inflammatory, but any of the fish oils are really good for you. So as much of that as you can eat is very good for your health. 
Down here, I just put a couple of natural things you can do for pain. Bromelain comes from the core of a pineapple. It's really a good natural pain reliever. Inflammation, you've heard of turmeric, or turmeric, so however you want to pronounce it for different people, but also Arnica Montana. You can get them in creams, you can take them internally. They're really good for digestion. They're really good for inflammation. Uh, if you ever have a bite, a spider bite, snake bite, you have poisonous, food poisoning, uh, activated charcoal is fantastic. It kills all the time. It binds different toxins to it and pulls it out of the body. You just have to be really careful if you're taking medications. Don't take it within a certain amount of time. This is one of the reasons why if people have uh, overdosed when they go to the hospital, they will pump them full of charcoal because it pulls all that toxin out of the system. So these are just some of the essential, uh, again, what I consider critical. If you want to maintain your optimal health, we need to have these supplements. We just don't get enough of them in our daily diet. <clears throat> so the vitamin D comes from, from the sun. When the sunlight hits your skin, it converts the cholesterol in your skin to vitamin D3. And it's very, very important. So you need at least 20 minutes every day. And I know, especially here in Singapore, we don't get that. People are outside with their umbrellas and so forth. So this is even more important why uh, essential that we get these supplements. So most regions don't get that much, okay? So vitamin D supplementation, this is even going up to 8,000 per day. So if you want to be healthy, we need to have these uh, enough vitamin D. These are some of the disorders that can happen if you're deficient. Digestive disorders, skeletal disorders like osteoporosis, very common. Uh, depression and mental disorders, uh, autism, brain dysfunction, dementia, Alzheimer's, chronic infections, uh, people with cardiovascular, all types of cancer, autoimmune diseases, and premature aging. So as you can see, it's probably one of the most potent and needed uh, supplements in our body, and yet the vast, vast majority, probably close to 80 to 90% of the population is deficient in vitamin D. So very important. If you're not out in the sun every day, start taking it. Fish oils, the omega-3s, these are really good for morning stiffness, pain and swelling. They're also really good for artery, lowering the blood cholesterol in your system. So they're very, very uh, healthy. Here's some of the consequences if you don't get enough magnesium. I have a lot of patients come in with cramping in their legs at night, those types of, usually it's a, a magnesium deficiency. But fatigue, weakness, abnormal heart rhythm, rhythm because magnesium is essential for muscle function, depression, heart disease, insomnia, again you can see all these blood clots, tooth decay, musculoskeletal problems, neurologic disorders, fibromyalgia, seizures, coronary spasms, personality changes. Magnesium is an essential mineral and so if you don't get it, you need a thousand milligrams a day, you need to be taking this. Uh, it comes from a lot of leafy green vegetables, uh, but you'd need like eight or ten servings a day most of us just don't eat that much um, it's an important concept to remember that if we keep doing what we're doing or what other people are doing we're going to keep getting what we're getting if we want to have health if we are going down a downward trajectory if we're aging if we're starting to have sickness uh, if we're starting to have any type of symptoms of tension then we need to change that otherwise we're just going to keep going down that slope so it's really all about lifestyle Okay, we talked about this last time. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. I got another one with it. But both of these women are 80 years old. Basically, the daily choices is what's the difference between these two. They weren't born this way. You can tell one was very focused, probably put in a lot more effort. Uh, eating, dieting, exercising, uh, getting adjustments, to make sure the central nervous system is functioning, eating natural as, uh, food as possible. And the other one waited. They, we were in the sick care mode. And it's not sometimes their fault, they just didn't know any better. So the purpose of getting this information out is we want to avoid this. This woman here on this side is literally just surviving or existing. You can tell she's probably not in the mood to go on some nice vacation or, or really play with the grandkids too much or great grandkids by that age. Um, where this woman you could tell would really have great lifestyle. So the quality of our life is determined by what we do starting right now. So if you're already having a sick type uh, healthcare, if you're starting to have problems, it's even more important that we get started immediately on our lifestyle choices. Again, two men that are the same age, obviously you can tell which one's been focused on their diet and their exercise programs. Um, it really has to do with their lifestyle. You can tell which one's gonna enjoy their life a lot more than the other. Um, so the, the future you choose, it's really up to you. 
We can choose the sick care method and wait till a disease happens and then accept the consequence. Or we can put in a little more effort every single day, what we're eating, how we're sleeping, if we're exercising, getting your immune system adjusted, uh, your spine adjusted from the chiropractor regularly, continually, so that we can maintain as best function as we can. And that's what this is all about. That's what this whole series is about. So health for life is quality for life. It really has to do with the difference between living your life and just existing. And I'm hoping, I know after practicing around the world for different countries, everybody wants to be healthy and have a quality life, be able to travel, enjoy their kids and grandkids, do their favorite hobbies. But if we don't make right choices and prevent those problems, we're gonna have, it's gonna take away our goals and our dreams. So that's what we're trying to avoid. So next week, we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, part three is going to be about posture, how our posture and our daily habits play an effect on our health, on our, on our central nervous system. Um, and so we really want to focus on this. It's really important for kids, especially that are on their phones and computers a lot. The way we sit, especially during COVID, and a lot of people are working from home now, sitting on different chairs. So we really want to talk about how to help our posture during those times. So please, again, um, if you haven't seen the first one, go back and watch those. Send these out to all of your friends, your colleagues. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact our office by email. You can call in. We'll happily respond to those as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I had a list of questions when I left them in the other room. Um, so follow up. Uh, it'll probably be next week or maybe even the week after. We'll have Series 3 on posture. Until then, please take care. Stay safe and look forward to seeing all of you. Thanks.